Pittsburgh is a, is a practical town. Pittsburgh is a town of industry. It's a town of innovation. Um, we like to think about ourselves as uh, people who get stuff done. Um, I got my PhD training in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon, and I still can't work an overhead. Um, I uh, teach now at the University of Pittsburgh, and I've lived almost half my life in Pittsburgh. And there's an ethos there that is reflected in our history that finds its way into our uh, theory making, our practice, um, the academy as well. And I'd like to think about what I do as developing practical learning theories. And the idea of a practical theory is it's, <clears throat> it's a theory that is developed at the same grain size as practice. So the things we talk about in the academy are things that make sense, they resonate with practitioners, and they can be put immediately into practice. Practical theories are measurable, so we know if we're doing something, and they're investable, so that you can build interventions around those theories. Um, I am not a sociologist, uh, and I take my role as the discussant here as reacting to the notion of capital, science capital, as something that um, is potentially a practical theory of learning. So what I'm gonna do is, oh, but this is Pittsburgh. Um, these are our three rivers. It used to be lined with steel mills. It's now lined with universities and technology companies. And what we've been wondering about in Pittsburgh quite a lot is this notion of out of school learning. And I'm gonna develop the idea of a learning ecology and connect it to the idea of science capital here. So this is a picture, some of you may have seen it. It's um, in a book by our National Academy of Sciences. And what it shows is the proportion of your life that you spend in school, which is the orange middle band, and out of school, which is what some of us call the deep blue sea of life. And when we talk about science education, uh, we often think about it as a pipeline through school. We remarked upon that this morning. Um, and so there's a series of experiences, there are gatekeepers, there's high stakes exams, which you must get through in order to come out the other side into this rarefied uh, position of being a, a STEM professional or a person who values STEM highly. But what is becoming known as the ecological perspective recognizes that in fact, your science learning looks a whole more, a lot more like this. You bump into moments where you can learn about science everywhere. Museums, after school clubs, television at home, in the kitchen, um, and yes, sometimes in school as well. And what I like about what the ecological view does is it changes our discourse from that of a pipeline and a set of barriers that need to be vaulted into a problem of how do we navigate pathways through this complex ecology where we recognize we're developing STEM expertise, we seek it out, and we know what to do with it when we see it. So um, <clears throat> learning ecologies um, emphasize pathways. Uh, and the thing about pathways, we've done some retrospective uh, studies of scientists asking them how they got into science and artists asking them how they got into art. And an ecological perspective reminds you there is no modal pathway. It's true. If kids know by the age of 13 that they're going to be in science, that's correlated with ending up in science. But that describes less than 50% of the people who end up in science. Um, it's the biggest bin you can recognize, but lots of people find their way into science without saying, I want to work as a scientist at the age of 13. Um, and there's lots of outcomes in science beyond being a professor or working in industry um, as well. Pathways, I think, raise the idea, and this is where I'm going to, in the end, say science capital is really important. If you have an ecosystem that supports pathways, how do you measure the health of that ecosystem? How do you know if you're intervening in a way that makes the world better? Um, and so this idea about investment and intervention, if you take an ecosystem's approach, and I think this resonates very well with capital as well, does that change the choices you make as an investor. Um, I heard at the beginning of this meeting a claim that schools were going to be used to generate science capital in the UK. Um, that seems to me a bet that a funder is making and that a project is making. Um, I would like to argue, as others have, um, schools may not be the best factories for science capital and they may not even be the cheapest way to reach the most diverse groups of people. 
So here's Pittsburgh again. What we decided to take on as a challenge was to take this roughly 20 square mile picture I'm showing you and design in it intentional pathways for learning um, that would make the ecology more accessible and more useful to STEM learners. Uh, I won't talk much about this. It's a project of the Activation Lab. Here are some of our partners that we're working with. Um, and just very briefly, our notion of an outcome is that when you have a science learning experience, you can become activated towards science, which we define as a composition of disposition, skills, and knowledge that enable you to be successful the next time in the ecology you bump into a science learning experience. You choose to do it, you engage with it, and you learn something for it from it. So our idea of what science education about is about is a series of supported moments where you have success and you develop momentum on a STEM pathway. So what we've done in Pittsburgh um, is to try to design an ecology where there is a shared aspiration for what the youth of Pittsburgh will look like in terms of STEM outcomes. We're building a research and practice infrastructure which allows us to take this wild ecology and kind of garden it into some predictable pathways that um, youth may be able to go down. It's a bottom-up approach which builds from the resources that are already in place in Pittsburgh. And it's also linked. We have a measurement of activation we've been working on for a couple of years. It's linked to the idea that if you have systemic regional um, infrastructure, you would have to have indicators that show that it is getting healthier as a result of the um, investment and the intervention. So what we're doing is we have a group of people called design fellows. They are dual citizens in research and practice. They live half their life in the university. The other half of their life, they live out in the world of practice. I guess the other half of their life, they're at home asleep. Um, what they do is work with organizations to rethink what you do as an out-of-school educator from providing an experience that's useful to an experience that's part of a broader pathway that goes somewhere in the city. Uh, the design fellows are collecting and using data for decision making, and we think about them sociologically as pollinators who kind of have in their heads the collective language of research and practice and can go around and help grow a culture of research and practice throughout town. So I'm going to talk about two um, problems we've encountered from our ecological viewpoint, which I think relate directly to social capital. The first, or uh, what are we talking about today? Scientific capital, sorry. Um, the pamphlet problem is what we call the first one. So if you're a parent who has a child who is interested in art or technology, and it's Saturday, and you have some time on your hands, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to Google. You're going to look for opportunities to in get in touch with science and technology somewhere in the world. You go there, and oftentimes at the end, there's very helpfully been uh, displayed a set of pamphlets of a thousand other things that you might do um, in town with your kid. And this is really all that most people have access to in terms of how can I cash out in this town? How can I take this experience and connect it to something else? Well, there's a thousand things you could do, so choose one of them and do it. Um, so we sat a bunch of parents down, we gave them pamphlets from all over town, and we interviewed them about what they saw. What do these programs look like to you? And what we find is a lot of the language that we use when we talk about our educational objectives and our activities um, interacts really differently with different groups of parents from around town. So you may have heard of Scratch, which is a computer language developed at MIT. It's a very big deal around the world. Uh, we have a real fixation with Scratch in Pittsburgh. And so many of these pamphlets say, come and learn Scratch, developed by MIT. You'll love computers. And for some parents in town, mostly those who are associated with the university, that's real credibility. Oh yeah, MIT, yeah, that'll be good. Scratchy, yeah, I know what that is. I have some colleagues who work on that, and this is going to be perfect for my kids. But other parents in town read the front of that, and they don't recognize a thing. This is clearly not for me or for my kids, because I'm pretty sure my kid's not going to MIT if I even know what MIT is. I've never heard of Scratch before, so probably my kid doesn't have what it takes to be successful here, even though most of these programs are designed precisely for the kinds of um, audiences who just opted out because of the way we talk about um, our experiences. So that's a kind of capital 
that the parents lack and that the town does a terrible um, job providing because we leave it to chance. It's an accident. We all just design something off the top of our heads without thinking about who is reading it for what purposes and where they're going to go next. Um, another problem we have, and this is with educators, not parents, uh, we're working with a, a parks group who, um, Pittsburgh, like many other uh, towns, has an, a, a wealth of environmental education organizations. And again, when people have experiences in a single program, and it comes time to recommend a teacher or an educator to recommend, hey, you really seem to like um, biosurveys, and you know there's something else you could do that's an intermediate experience or a deep dive into that, because I can see you're really interested into nature. These organizations don't think about each other as partners. They're not aware of the work that happens at the other organizations. And importantly, they think about their audiences as they're trying to capture them, get them in the door, keep them coming back to my organization. So from a regional perspective, that's super dysfunctional because what we're doing is creating a bunch of silos that essentially are trying to redo the same thing over and over. And in Pittsburgh, our landscape survey suggests we have a lot of introductory experiences for the same kinds of kids. We have nowhere to send them afterwards and very few deep dives that would allow someone to really get involved in environmental or, or ecology stuff if they were interesting. Interested, they're all interesting, but are they interested? So some things about pathways. Uh, there can't be hundreds of pathways through a city. Uh, you can't design and support hundreds of pathways if you're not just gonna leave it up to fate and accident. So how many should there be? I think five, maybe more than five, maybe 10. We don't know, it's an empirical question. Research has to be done about what pathways look like, how parents and children and, and educators uh, what tools they need to recognize and navigate those pathways. There need to be on-ramps everywhere. There need to be middle experiences and some advanced experiences that really connect you to the transformative things we know that happen in like STEM internships. And finally, it's really hard from an organizational perspective. This is the central problem of practice. How do you rethink your outcomes to be about the child's trajectory and not what you tried to accomplish at the end of the day? So. Is something like science capital going to be useful for someone who's interested in a learning ecology's approach? Um, these are so small. If I just go over here, I can read them. Okay. One of the things I found very useful um, in the paper and in the session today is this idea that the resources that are important are not focused solely at schools. We all know that. It needs to be repeated every time um, we give a talk like this. This idea of symbolic and inherited capital, denied capital, that you don't recognize as a thing you are using to um, advance yourself in the system, I think is very important. And the pamphlet problem and the e ecological pathways are two examples of us trusting in a system that some people can navigate. And we kind of design for those people in the back of our minds. But that's an unequal playing field. Lots of people don't recognize the pathway. They don't know how to navigate it. And we don't even know that that's a skill. So interventions that um, recognize it as not denied capital, but things that you must build, I think are important. Associations between capital and outcomes, I would like to see a lot more research on that. Um, a lot of these associations could be true. Like if you have a scientist parent, you may be more likely to go into science but lots of people go into science who don't have a parent who's a scientist. And even if it's true, like in that, it's not an investable lever. So it's not as if we can change that. So I would like to see the capital idea focused on what we can actually change, as opposed to describing a system that we suspect is there, but that isn't something we can directly intervene on. The notion of pathways doesn't focus capital on certain gatekeeping moments. It requires you to accumulate and expend capital through the entire pathway. In our life histories, we have lots of people who learned to love science in an out-of-school experience, bumped into it in school, said, that's not what I love. I don't see that as science. My teacher doesn't recognize my expertise. And we think about um, what we call activation, but what I think you might also see as related to science capital, as the thing that makes you resilient. It makes you resist the vision of science that perhaps would turn you off and um, keep you not motivated to go down the pathway. 
And then finally, um, and I think this is really uh, important from a measurement perspective, uh, what I like about the idea of capital, our idea of activation is, is really carried by the child. It's a thing we do to children, well, a thing we're part of helping create in children that they move from experience to experience with. But if you think about that picture of Pittsburgh and that regional ecology, and you want to ask, is this a town that's rich in science learners and science learning opportunities? It brings up a whole host of measurements, of ideas about strength, of ideas about um, how this town works as a system. So how capital is distributed, how capital can be built within organizations and made accessible and built within individuals, which I find personally very exciting and challenging as a learning scientist who's used to looking at individual outcomes. Um, I'm hoping that this conversation can get us to a place where we recognize more of what's systemic, um, still measurable, still investable, still intervenable, but what we're systemically building as we're working on STEM education in school and out.